Okay, I am going to give a brief kind of overview approach uh, to initially Christianity in Australia and then a bit of the Baptist work in New South Wales. Andrew is going to follow by looking at Baptist work in Tasmania and Troy will conclude with Baptist work in Queensland. So, um, my claim to fame is that my ancestor was on the first fleet. Uh, my ancestor, Richard Morgan, was a convict uh, from Bristol who uh, was a gunsmith and various other things, but he got caught in some dicey areas, which I won't for the sake of family propriety, <laughs> <laughs> and found himself on his way here in the First Fleet. And um, so somebody kindly wrote a, a novel on his life, uh, Colleen McCulloch, who's uh, written many other novels. Uh, she's also a descendant of Richard Morgan, so it's nice to know a bit about my uh, ancestor through, through her work. Uh, he ended up in Norfolk Island after being in New South Wales. Um, so Australia and the work of the Gospel in Australia to us as Australians is something significant to, to learn about in particular. Um, on that first fleet, which included Richard Morgan, my ancestor, was Richard Johnson. And Richard Johnson was over as chaplain of the first fleet, which is a very unromantic, un, uh, well, terrible job to be given, right? actually. He, he accepted it for gospel cause, but it wasn't an easy gig by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, this nation, of course, as you know, began as a, a prison, a thief colony, a dumping ground for prisoners. Uh, of course, the previous uh, imprisonment of choice when the jails in England filled up was putting people on these barges, these boats, which were just on the, the ground there in England and various ports, and they were overflowing with criminals, so they were looking for new places to get rid of uh, the criminal element. Uh, some of them were, as has been often pointed out, uh, only guilty of things like stealing a piece of bread or whatever, so they could be very simple things for which you could have been transported uh, to, to this country, but that wasn't the universal idea. A lot of the guys who came, women who came, were hardened criminals. Uh, so it was a very difficult, difficult environment to be. Um, Joseph Banks, who'd of course been with Cook, recommended Australia as a prison. Uh, the first governor was Governor Arthur Phillip. Uh, he was described as having or being a common sense man with a contempt for revealed sorry, with a contempt for revealed religion, uh, so he was no Christian by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, he had an esteem for the established church as the educator of the masses and maybe a moralizing influence on the initial convicts. So the church may have had some kind of benefit uh, to him in that area, but he certainly was a man, was not a man who knew Christ love the Word of God. Um, Philip arrived at Botany Bay. Uh, at one point in his speech he refuted... Sorry, where am I? I jumped somewhere. Let me jump that. Uh, Roman Catholic priests were forbidden to come in the First Fleet, so the Church of England had the inside running. Uh, the chaplain was Richard Johnson, who was a product of the Evangelical Revival. So Richard Johnson was a Yorkshireman, he was a very good man, a believing Christian man, a man who basically exhausted himself in the work of the Gospel in those early years. As I said, many of the early convicts were professional criminals, and no cheaper mode could be found to dispose of criminals than sending them off uh, here. Um, the government initially was going to send the First Fleet without a chaplain. So no ministry, no religious instruction of any type. That was not a priority to the British government in 1788. But some men you may have heard of, uh, like John Newton and William Wilberforce and Charles Simeon and others influenced them to send one man, one chaplain. Chaplain chosen was Richard Johnson. Richard Johnson was 31. He was married to Mary. And they headed off on the First Fleet to Australia. And 
It didn't take five months like going to India. You know how, how long the first fleet took to get here? Close, eight and a half months. So you're on these convict ships uh, in very poor conditions for eight and a half months. And they arrive here. They arrive actually in Sydney on a, in the midst of a great thunderstorm. Uh, and what occurred there is they described by Richard Johnson, the chaplain, and others as an awful carnival of debauchery. Because finally, after eight and a half months on the ship, the male convicts were allowed to mingle, <laughs> inverted commas, with the female convicts. And in the midst of this thunderstorm, there's this immorality taking place as these men and women get together for the first time after that, that journey. And Richard Johnson's just trying to process where he is uh, in the midst of all this. But he was a gospel man. He got little or no support uh, from the governor. Uh, he was a man who sought to preach the gospel. He preached his first sermon. Does anybody know what he preached his first sermon on? Yes, it was. Close. Psalm 116. Here is the first sermon preached on Australian soil. If you go to Sydney, amongst the office buildings, there's a little spot there where a plaque marks this, uh, where there was a tree there, and he preached on, after eight and a half months, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? It's a great start. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? He's sent us here and here we are and there are gospel opportunities here he's actually preserved our lives over the course of this terrible journey what shall i render to the lord for all his benefits to me verse 13 i will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the lord so that was the idea uh, the lord has been good to us let us respond by lifting up the cup of salvation and calling on his name so that was february the 3rd 1788 the first sermon preached Many people have, just, have made the point that really what could be described uh, at that time was were best described by Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. So there was sin abounding. Uh, there was, it was a, a crazy situation, really, because on the first fleet, with all the petty criminals and all the people from various backgrounds and the soldiers, etc., there was not one farmer. That's... <laughs> that's dumb isn't it that's crazy you come across to the other side of the world you've heard a bit from cook's journals etc what the conditions are like but uh, you're going to need food and you don't take a farmer with you don't turn anybody with any take anybody with any expertise in that area on, on the ship's supply manifest uh, for the people who went there was one bible so that's the place of christianity uh, one bible that'll do us no chaplain originally, one chaplain has made it on board with his wife, uh, but that's the priority of Christianity in the mindset of the First Fleet. Johnson uh, had his own supply of Bibles. He took 100 Bibles, 400 New Testaments, 500 books of Psalms, 200 copies of the Sermon on the Mount, and various books on practical morality, and 100 spelling books. <coughs> Okay, so that was Johnson's own supply. Sexual immorality was commonplace. Convicts, convicts and marines were dumped miles away from normal family life and expected to survive. At one stage, Governor Philip allowed Johnson to hold a Sunday service, but you can only hold it at 6 a.m. Uh, so he wanted to discourage people from going. So you have your Sunday service. There is... Minister Richard Johnson preaching the word of God and conducting service, but it's at 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, it was four years before they agreed to build him a church. And finally, a church had to be built because he built it himself. Uh, that first church building was burnt down five years later. Uh, Richard and Mary's first baby in Australia was stillborn. Uh, this sort of cries out for Christian grace. 
and Christian patience. And if you read some of the things that this man wrote in his letters and in his diary, it's a, it's a wonderful example of Christian grace. He's in a terribly frustrating situation where elderly authorities are conspiring against him until the second governor comes. Second governor is Hunter, and Hunter has some genuine faith and some evangelical sympathies. But first governor, Philip, no. He had great sorrow that his ministry failed to touch the convicts. He probably came to the verge of a, a breakdown, yet he held on in faith and patience, laboring for the glory of God, both in Sydney Cove and then going often on a Sunday uh, 12 to 14 miles up the river to Parramatta and uh, preaching there also, uh, finding a little room in Parramatta where he could collapse <laughs> before returning to Sydney. Uh, so he's laboring in that kind of environment with, with little or no support. He said he, he really loved to get down into the convicts' huts and talk with them about their souls. So even more than preaching, he loved to interact with people about the gospel. And he got into the huts of the convicts and tried to get alongside them and, and share the gospel with them in a real manner. Uh, in his family home with Mary and uh, some servants, they also, and their two sons, I think, at that point, uh, he also took in two Aboriginal girls and cared for them. Uh, one of them was 15 years old and she had smallpox and Richard Johnson and Mary nursed her to health and then sought to teach her the word of God. Uh, in 1799, after 10 or 11 years of these labours, uh, Johnson's health is broken and he returns to England. So that's how Christianity gets to our, our shores uh, through Richard Johnson, followed by his assistant Samuel Marsden. Now, depending on where you're from, you might know various things about Samuel Marsden, a man of faith, a man of prayer, a man physically and mentally stronger than Johnson. Uh, in 1810, he saw great things that gave him hope, and he was the first believer to preach the gospel in New Zealand. I can talk to you at length about that, but that's not the... the um, he was he's in New Zealand, Samuel Marsden from Parramatta is called the Apostle to New Zealand. Okay, He made... Was it 12 or 14 trips across the Tasman during his lifetime and established the CMS missionaries and took them there and, and did all sorts of work there in New Zealand and also established a solid work, even though he's known as the flogging parson um, because he was also a magistrate uh, in Parramatta. So that's some of the background. And in that background, after Marsden, about... A decade or two down the track, Baptists arrive. <laughs> uh, Baptists are virtually the last of these groups on the scene. Uh, some of them felt inferior. Some of them wanted to catch up with the larger denominations. Some of them sadly even compromised a little bit to try and fit in and, and uh, get some prominence. Remember the character of the 19th century English church at this point. Um, the chief doctrinal outlook in the 1850s of nonconformity was Arminian. Um, Spurgeon was fighting against this in the downgrade, which we'll see a little bit later, but that's the general milieu, the environment, the atmosphere. Uh, the downgrade controversy, higher critical views are coming in of Scripture, and these things are downgrading the church and putting less emphasis on the doctrine of Scripture. Spurgeon, of course, eventually withdrew from the Baptist Union over these issues to do with the Word of God. So, 19th century non-conformist religion, second half of the 19th century, a period of religious decline in Britain. And so when the work gets established in Australia, you've got some Baptists and others who were sick of the way things were going in England and wanted to come to a new place, make a fresh start and have the gospel focus, but others brought with them the contemporary flavour of religion and Baptist life in England. 24th of April, 1831, in the long room of the Rose and Crown Inn in Sydney was the first Baptist service in Australia. 24th of April, 1831, in the long room of the Rose and Crown Inn, the preacher on that day was an interesting man called John McCaig. Uh, 
M-C-K-A-E-G, John McCaig. He was a Highland Scot. We'll talk about him in a moment. Uh, on the 12th of August, 1832, was the first believer's baptism at Woolloomooloo Bay. Now that's why this man has entitled his work on Baptist history in Australia as From Woolloomooloo to Eternity. Now he means eternity in terms of the riding of eternity on the footpaths, foot, footpaths of Sydney uh, later, but Woolloomooloo was the start. So on the 12th of August 1832, a baptism occurs. Uh, two women were baptised by John McCaig um, and it was a pretty sorry situation actually because there was a lot of opposition. People thought this was a great deal of entertainment to see one, somebody baptised in this way and uh, somebody actually dove down underneath and pulled McCaig's feet from him at one point uh, so he also would be soaked and they thought it was a great laugh but two women were baptised on that date in August 1832 so first service first baptism. In 1834, and McCaig, by the way, has a very sorry life. Uh, he proves to be a drunkard. Uh, he's imprisoned, mainly over issues of debt. And so Baptist work in Australia is not some kind of strategic, planned, church planting work in Sydney initially. It's a, a, a sort of, I use the word loosely, renegade Baptist preacher who later disqualifies himself, who preaches the first sermon and conducts the first baptism. In 1834, the first Baptist church in Sydney is established. First Baptist church in New South Wales. It's in Bath Bathurst Street. It's a Bathurst Street congregation. Actually, sorry, opened in 1836. Saunders arrived. John Saunders arrived in 1834 and he opened that church in 1836. <coughs> Saunders wanted to found the church on the word. He hammered out a statement of belief. He insisted the minister be of the particular Baptist persuasion. He accepted the shorter catechism, except on the issue of baptism. He was essentially reformed in his theology, but in some other ways he was a bit light on, ba on Baptist distinctives. Uh, John Saunders was a very Catholic spirited man, and so he had members in his church who were pedo-Baptist, because he wanted to strengthen a small work in a difficult place. So he had two classes of members on the roll. You had the Baptist members and you had your other members who could have been pedo-Baptists in their orientation. So the issue of open or closed membership and communion became very real in those early days. Uh, people were, some people uh, sought to elevate Baptist distinctives over the Word of God and the Baptists were included amongst that. So first church, Bathurst Street, 1836, John Saunders. Second church established in New South Wales was at Parramatta. Pastor was William Carey, <laughs> William Hopkins Carey. And that church at Parramatta was established in 1851. Uh, Goulburn Street in the centre of the city was established in 1854. Smithfield, we have some friends at Smithfield Baptist, established in 1857 as a church plant from Bathurst Street. Kiama, a bit down the south coast, 1858, Newtown Baptist, some friends at Newtown Baptist, established in 1860 on June the 3rd as a church plant from Bathurst Street. And down the list of the early 10 or 15 churches, you've got churches within Sydney, you've got churches in country areas, so one is established in Maitland and Bathurst and Newcastle and Walls End and other places. And the work is growing particularly through the 1850s and the 1860s. And you get up to about 15 Baptist churches over that period. The, the first controversy, I, he says carefully looking at his watch, his first controversy uh, in New South Wales Baptist churches was that with John Saunders over the policy of open church membership. Uh, Saunders published a sermon, an invitation to fellowship. He wanted the church, because of the circumstances, to be a Christian church in preference to being sectarian. He wanted the church to have, be a place where there was fellowship with all true 
believers in a foreign land with not many believers. He was trying to promote that kind of emphasis. Uh, many who sought a Baptist church, believe it or not, did so with a view to gaining influence and respectability. So some came to Australia with the mindset, maybe through having guys like Spurgeon operating, uh, not, well, not here, but guys well established operating that being the Baptist or being a Baptist is the chief thing. James Voller. The Bathurst Street Church requested a pastor from Britain. This was after Saunders, after a man called John Hamm had a brief ministry. And the Bathurst Street Church requested a pastor from Britain. And out came James Voller. V-O-L-L-E-R. And Voller was essentially a denominational man, a believing man, a denominational man in the sense that he wanted to establish Baptist witness. And he sought to do that by raising funds in Australia and also in Britain. And he wanted to bring out suitable ministers from England uh, in that period to establish the work here in Australia. In 1860 to 61, trouble arose in the Bathurst Street Church Uh, Voller did not, in his ministry, emphasize the doctrines of grace. So, while he emphasized believers' baptism, he downplayed some of those other truths. And at that time, some left Bathurst Street to found the Newtown Church. Arriving in Sydney around that time was a man called John Bunyan McCure. So, you got William Carey and John Bunyan were doing well for Baptist work in Australia, Uh, and John Bunyan McCure was a particular Baptist pastor from England. In fact, nearly all the first Baptist pastors and preachers and congregations in New South Wales Wales were particular Baptists in their orientation, and John Bunyan McCure established a church at Castle Ray Street. So here are some of the earlier days. Uh, The Masonic Hall Church, which is a funny name for a church, but they met in the Masonic Hall, Uh, The Masonic Hall Church calls a man from Spurgeon's College. And out comes Frederick Hibbard, who is the pastor of that early work. This was in Harris Street in Sydney. Establishes that work from, uh, pastors that work from 1863 to 1867. Hibbard has immediate fellowship with McCure and the Castle Ray Street Church. Around that time, an association of Baptist churches is formed by two churches, the Harris Street Church and Newtown Baptist Church. And these churches are both of particular Baptist persuasion. Uh, Castle Ray Street didn't join in because their pastor was overseas at the time. So you've got this building work, you've got men initially from particular Baptist persuasion particularly, but you've also got some kind of emphasis because you're in a foreign land and there are a few evangelical non-conformist, dissenting uh, people around, you're also trying to think through the question, you know, do we encourage these other believers who don't share our particular distinctives and bring them into the church, or do we just go it alone and and emphasize some of these distinctives? Uh, These are real issues at the time. Uh, Castle Ray Street eventually denies or declines becoming part of that association. And begins another association, which was eventually known as the Baptist Union of New South Wales. The first chairman of that association was James Voller. Uh, They emphasised a broader platform and they refused, for example, what became the Baptist Union, refused to endorse a magazine, the centrefold of which was to be a sermon by Spurgeon's. Okay, we're not endorsing that because Spurgeon is too clear on where he's coming from. And in our Baptist magazine, we don't want his sermon to be the centerpiece because he's from that particular Baptist strain. So they're trying to make their way in a new land and they're struggling with their identity. By 1877, what was the Baptist Union stood for comprehension. In other words, people are welcome within evangelical limits. So, if you're evangelical, you're welcome within the Baptist world, but outside of that, if you want to emphasize Baptist distinctives and the doctrine, particular Baptist doctrine, that's not really 
the emphasis at this time. By this stage, some churches became specifically particular Baptist churches. Uh, the church at Wall's End near Newcastle and Lambton was another church that became particular Baptist at that point. I am going to mention South Australia, only to mention one word, not because I have anything against South Australia, but South Australia in these early days as a colony, which wasn't a convict colony, uh, became known as the paradise of dissent. So the dissenters found a home in South Australia. Uh, it was a place where there was a, a real emphasis. Uh, Sturt followed his explorers uh, up a good river near Cape Vincent. Uh, some believers have high plans for a new colony. For example, a man called Fife Angus, and he wanted a place for pious settlers, godly settlers, a colony where there will be no convicts. So South Australia becomes known as the paradise of dissent. The First Baptists there emphasised closed membership tradition and tended a bit towards denominational isolation. Well, with two minutes left, I'm going to hand it over. I could go into individual biographies, uh, three of them for a minute each, but I don't think it's very worthwhile. So that's a bit of a platform. We're in the midst of the 19th century, the great century for mission. Uh, we see God at work and churches being established around the world, uh, Baptist work being established around the world. And in the midst of that, Baptist believers come initially to Sydney and services start, baptism, church planted. And this is something of the flavour of the early days there. But for a far more comprehensive treatment of Tasmania, Andrew, thank you.